Hello, welcome back. Um, I hope everyone's doing well. Sorry I've been away for a while. Um, I had to uh, to go away for a few days. And also, um, I've been trying to finish the book. So I've gotten through almost uh, chapter 8. So I'm going to update you um, very shortly and one at a time, chapters uh, 4 through 8. And I've received my book, Fun and Freedom, and I've read it in its entirety. So I will be... Um, telling you what I found in there, and um, and of course, I'm sure you've already heard. It's just a bunch of um, um, untruths and uh, Megan's version of events, and uh, she and Harry are just seem to be victimizing themselves, uh, playing the victim. But anyway, let's get on with the book review and chapter four with Lady C. And this is Harry, excuse me, Megan and Harry, the real story with Lady Colin Campbell is the author. Okay, and I'll just go through to the items that I've highlighted. And let's start with um, the Internet changed. Uh, within hours of the Sunday Express revealing Megan's existence into Harry's life, all the major publications had cobbled stories uh, together and posted them on their web pages. The degree of information, all positive, was impressive. At the time, no one thought anything of it. The existence of the TIG did not trigger the suspicion that Megan herself might be pulling the strings to the uh, marionettes to jump the way she wanted. Most journalists assume that actresses are too dumb to write their own lines, much less fashion uh, their own narrative. The TIG, they assume, was written by someone else and always had been. Okay. <clears throat> There was also the issue of Megan's past as well as her position as an actress. Although the British press chose to present her as a major star and one moreover covered in respectability, the press in many other countries took a more jaundiced view. Why did the Western media have to exaggerate her status um, if she truly was a suitable match for uh, Prince Harry? Although in tone and content, some of them akin the National Enquirer in the United States, many others are more serious and solid publications. The word tabloid, God bless you, my dog, uh, connotes uh, something of the sleazy supermarket variety to Americans. But in the rest, to the rest of the world, it lacks those pejorative overtones and is simply a description of the more has popular end of the press. Nevertheless, all these publications share one aim with the sleazier element of the American market. They aim to unmask and will stop at nothing to get to the bottom of a story as long it is uh, topical enough. Excuse me. Speaking as someone who has had to... Um, Oh, excuse me. Megan was in her mid-30s. She had lived a full life. She had had a series of men. She had tried her hand at many different activities. There was never any doubt that the world, um, that there would be layers to unfold, newsworthy stories to dig up. The only question was, how dirty would it, uh, the dirt be? The corrupting influence of filthy uh, liqueur also travels in the opposite direction. British newspapers especially are renowned for paying handsome sums to informants who might but equally might not have a firm handle on the facts. Many publications are cynical enough not to let the truth get in the way of a good story when they wish to present east as west and north as south. It takes no imagination to see the mill journalist on this uh, persuasion will make of sensational and verifiable facts. It took very little digging to discover uh, that the uh, beauteous A-lister of um, 30th and 31st of October had a backstory, and one moreover, that there was no need to embellish. Before the week was out, half of Fleet Street knew through their investigations in Hollywood and Toronto that Megan had a history of cultivating, captivating, denigrating, and discarding both men and women in her ascent to the top. A male journalist told me as she climbs up the next rung of her ladder, she plants the soles of her shoes on your head. And when you wipe your face off, you see that it's covered in cow dung. 
Megan, in other words, had discarded a whole loathe of friends of both sexes, aside from men with whom she had been involved, and done it in such a way that they had even become enemies. These people were happy to talk to the press, and when they were not, to direct journalists to someone else who would. Throughout the first week of November 2016, reporters from all over the world were offering huge sums of money for some of the discards to talk, and some did. Even when they did, not a capable journalist would have enough of a whiff to know that there was a body buried somewhere nearby. So rich were the pickings that the male journalist told me, it's not often that we find ourselves having to downplay instead of exaggerate. But with Megan, that's what we had to do. From the outset, it was the only way to get stories past the legal department. There was another and rather more touching dimension in the way the British press approached this scenario. A journalist from the Mirror encapsulated the whole thing perfectly by saying, no one wanted to hurt Harry. He was truly popular, and if this was the girl that he wanted, if she could make him happy, which she certainly seemed to be doing, no one wanted to rain on Harry's parade. Almost by common but silent consent, we all took a soft line. The line, however, wasn't soft enough for Megan, who wasn't used to an inquiring press, but to tame one which savage, savagely reported whatever she or her representatives fed them. By the end of the first week of real fame, she was so perturbed over the possibilities of what might be said that Harry issued a statement. Harry is also aware that there is a significant curiosity about his private life. He has never been comfortable with this, but he's tried to develop a thick skin about the level of media interest that comes with it. He's rarely taken former, uh, formal action on the very regular publications of fictional stories that are written about him, and he had worked hard to develop a professional relationship with the media, focused on his work and the issues he cares about. Prince Harry is worried about Miss Markle's safety and is deeply, deeply disappointed that he has not been able to protect her. It is not right that a few months into a relationship with him that Miss Markle should be subjected to such a storm. He knows that commentators will say this is the price she has to pay and that this is all a part of the game. He strongly disagrees. This is not a game. It is her life and his. Public Statement the statement was a masterstroke. Not only did Harry breach boundaries, but he also waded in to protect Megan in a way he had never done with Chelsea Davy or Cressida Bonus, both of whom had to endure years of press attention with never a word from him to protect, uh, to endure the years of press attention with never a word, then revealed that Megan was in a class of her, that revealed to the, everyone that Megan was in a class of her own. The statement also showed both of them uh, in the most popular of lights, gathering them sympathy from the le legions of romantics and admirers who were rooting uh, them on to long-term happiness. Speaking as a public figure, this had many friends in the public eye. I can tell you that no one ever reads the comments made about them on the Internet unless you're in the mood to have a good laugh. All public figures are regularly trolled. It goes with the territory, says Lady C. How appropriate is it for any member of the royal family in a constitutional monarchy which has to remain uh, politically neutral and respectful of the opinions of its citizens to take up with an aggressive, proactive, ambitious, opinionated, uh, left-wing political activist? The tick was visible proof that her beliefs and personality were incompatible with the royal role which she inevitably had to fulfill if her relationship with Harry should end in marriage. The valid question which she and Harry managed to divert the press away was a simple one. How will someone as uh, vo vo vivacious as Meghan Markle, whose posture is that she needs to use her voice, fit into a role that requires the silent acceptance of viewpoints which do not accord with her own? And I'm just going to get over to um, the disclaimer for a moment. Disclaimer can be found in the description below. All right. Um, by incorrectly assessing the extent of their success in seeing off negative publicity, Harry and Meghan were opening themselves up to a host of misconceptions regarding their control over the press. It is a pity Harry was too young when his mother was alive to appreciate how utterly her attempts to influence 
the press had rebounded to her detriment. So she's talking about Princess Diana and how she tried to use the press and many times it backfired and did not work to her advantage. No public figure in Britain can function without an in-depth understanding of how the British press works. It's unique. There is no other press like it in the world. It is so radically different from the North American press that Meghan was used to that she was totally unprepared for what living with its attentions would mean to her life. Had she and Harry not brought themselves the respite they did by issuing that statement, she might have understood before her marriage that she was a swimmer used to a well-heated pool being plunged into the icy chill of the North Sea in winter. Okay, just skipping around. This inevitably led to instability and the possibility of regime change, causing divided loyalties which drove dissent and gave a voice to those who would not otherwise have one. The world's freest press was born. No one thereafter would be impervious to the reach of journalists. No king, prince, aristocrat, government, official, public figure, or even private individual who caught the attention of the scribes. Megan's failure to appreciate these important differences would lead her down a very slippery slope. Had she tried to understand what she was dealing with and why it functioned as it did, she might have stood a chance, but in her ignorance, she lost the ability to cope. About Diana's car crash, um, Harry, of course, knew only too well what a viper's nest the British press can be. He had a real hatred of it, born of his belief that they had killed his mother. In fairness to them, they had done no such thing. Diana would have survived that car crash had she been wearing a seatbelt. She, she was also responsible for the press following her that night. She had telephoned journalists before leaving Sardinia to tip them off about her arrival in Paris. She continued tipping them off when she arrived in that city. You are being chased by people you have encouraged to chase you. You surely bear responsibility for creating the chase. Of course, Harry was only 12 when his mother died. He too was young to have a, a mature, too young to have a mature judgment about her as an individual. By his own account, when he met Megan, he still had not worked through the trauma of his mother's death. This was not necessarily a, f a failing on his part. There had been reams written on the emotional impact to children below the age of 14 when a parent dies. Harry's failure to grieve was therefore a natural part of the phenomenon of a child losing its parents. But that does not mean that the press were to blame. If you look at how open Megan was in her two blogs, it is obvious that uh, she committed to the most cardinal of all errors for anyone in public life. She revealed too much of herself. While she thought she was gaining, and gaining admirers through her openness and honesty, she was also giving potential detractors information that would ultimately be able to be used against her. I can think of a few people in public life who have exposed themselves to the extent that Megan did. One of the cardinal rules is that you batten down the hatches when journalists or servants are present. You do not tell reporters what your greatest hopes, your fears, your desires, ambitions, or any of the myriad of things Megan revealed on her two blogs. You do not write articles that are so revelatory that you might as well be talking to a psychiatrist. You do not leak stories about yourself or anyone else that you know. Nothing is more uncivilized than a public figure who cannot treat a pleasant journalist in a friendly manner. Up to then, Megan, she had managed her profile with uh, admirable dexterity. She had never had negative publicity, notwithstanding the fact that the landscape traversed by her was littered with the remnants of former relationships. The reason why was simple. Up to then, she had simply not been famous enough to warrant negative attention. Until the 30th of October, 2016, however, all Megan's media coverage had been solicited either by herself or through the studios. She had, in reality, been a column filler, the sort of semi-celebrity that journalists use to pad out pages when there's nothing worth reporting upon or when they have to pay back film companies in a quid pro quo way. 
the first wave of stories had been so positive that the tabloids wanted to uh, redress the balance with a touch of sensationalism. Their first port of call was anyone from her past who could inform them of what she was really like. To their credit, none of her formerly close friends, boyfriends, ex-husbands, or even family went on the record spilling secrets. They had all maintained a dignified silence when they had nothing positive to say. Now, what's not in the book is that um, it had been said that the royal family, once they vetted her, uh, scrubbed the Internet of things that uh, could be uh, damaging to her and to the monarchy. And that um, it had also been said, allegedly, that she had had uh, past relationships and past friendships and current friendships and people who were coming into her life to sign a non-disclosure, and it was said that she may have paid off the former boyfriends. Uh, we had heard that Trevor wanted to produce a show which was likely based on her new life, and that uh, allegedly she had paid him off to not do that. Back to the book. And again, chapter four. The picture that emerged was a mixed one. Some people liked their neighbors, had nothing negative to say, while others confided that she was a piece of work and an operator who was ruthless, ambitious, and practiced at dumpling, dumping people past their sell-by date. Ooh, that's rough. Although Harry and Meghan might have thought the clear run had been given to them was the sole result of their statement, this was far from the truth. The reasons were more complex than that. Despite the press and the palace knowing that dirt existed that could damage Meghan, fear played a smaller part in backing off than a combination of expediency and enlightened self-interest. The royal family had actually known of Meghan and Harry's relationship before the press did, when it became apparent that it was developing into something more than a three-night stand, the palace did what it always does. It launched its own investigations into Meghan's background, the way it always ascertains the backstory of every, or everyone who becomes a close associate of any member of the royal family. I was told by a courtier that there was concern about Meghan's past, but because it was just an affair and the view was, don't cross the bridge in case we don't want to come to it. It would have stopped the affair in its tracks before it had a chance to in develop into something more serious. It was fairly obvious from all that discovered about her past that she might be trouble with a capital T. The palace, of course, was not about to convey any of its concerns to the press. The hope was that the romance would run its course. Harry would meet a girl with a less complicated background and a more pliable character than anyone could breathe, then everyone would be able to breathe a sigh of relief. As we all know, the press did not break ranks, nor did anyone close to Meghan for the next six months. The first person to wade in was her half-sister, Samantha, who announced in April of 2017 that she was writing a book called The Diary of Princess Pushy's Sister. At that stage, her criticisms implied rather than uh, asserted, but this did Megan no harm and Samantha no favors. She came across as a jealous attention seeker intent on muscling in on a younger sibling's uh, success, half younger sibling. But I learned that there was actually a more poignant reason. Although neither sister had ever been close, there had always been a cordial relationship. But when Samantha reached out to Megan to congratulate her on her success, she was iced. In September, the Invictus Games was held in Toronto, and for the first time, Megan and Harry's officially appeared in public as a couple. She was in a chic, oversized man's white t-shirt tucked into fitted blue jeans. Throughout that appearance, they continued to be overtly physical, their hands and legs touching in a way of public display, display of attraction, generally conveying the message that they were a hot couple completely besotted with each other. Megan, the British royal family, would no longer um, be purely white with Megan. That would play well throughout the Commonwealth, especially as how the process of designating its next head was due to come up for discussion at the meeting of the heads of government in April 2018. Buckingham Palace announced Harry and Meghan's engagement on the 27th of November 2017. The news was greeted with genuine enthusiasm publicly. On the 20th of April 2018, the Queen got her fondest wish when Prince Charles was named as her successor to the headship of the Commonwealth. 
Several of the Commonwealth High Commissioners told me that there was little doubt that Harry's engagement to Meghan had made the appointment easier for all states involved. Between the announcements of the engagement and of Charles' appointment to succeed the Queen as head of the Commonwealth, the most glorious cock-up concerning color took place. At the Prince's annual luncheon party for all the members of the royal family at Buckingham Palace a few days before Christmas, she was photographed wearing a blackamoor brooch on her coat. This was, of course, Princess Michael of Kent. And the right mind who would uh, aspire to emulate. She is vain and tiresomely affected. I could take, uh, I would stake good money that if she wore that brooch to garner the attention she seeks at every turn, although she would later issue a statement claiming to be very sorry and distressed for any offense caused. I, for one, could not help feeling that she had deliberately set out to knock the newcomer off the front pages, which she did. If I did not point out that the brooch she was wearing cannot fairly have been regarded as possessing uh, racist overtones, for it did not represent a sub-Saharan black slave, but actually a North American aristocrat. It was Moretto Venezuelano, as the figures are known. These originated in Venice and have been made there from the dawn of the modern age until today. A whole lot of nonsense has been written, and I wish to defend an object that is rich in history and unique to Venice. The brooch depicts a Moorish Venetian prince. This was verified by the jewelry historian, who explained the blacks in these pieces were essentially being depicted as aristocrats. And over the years, these objects became one of the city's most important symbols, symbolizing to Venetians their openness to other cultures. Not only are such items not racist in origin, but they give off the most powerful message of inclusivity. Could Princess Michael have actually been conveying a positive message rather than the negative one that she was accused of? The Fab Four were, um, were together on a day, heightening expectations and raising Meghan's stock exponentially. It was Christmas at Sangraham. The Queen had broken precedent. For the first time ever, a fiancé had been asked to join the royal family for the Christmas celebrations. Meghan could not say as Diana had, and Catherine could have but never did, that she was not welcomed with open arms before the wedding ring was on her finger. So this was something that the royal family, in my words, was doing for Meghan, going out of their way. Not only was... Um, was she treated by everyone as if she were already a member of the family? The press had gone wild when they, when she, Harry, William, and Catherine had walked to church from the big house. The fat four were born that day, heightening expectations. On December the 27th, Harry Guest edited the BBC Radio 4's Today program. Oh, and we know that this is when he accidentally um, said that um, Megan. Let me look and find this and see if I've got this highlighted. Oh, it said Harry had acquitted himself admirably. He was warm, concerned, considered charming and interesting. He came across a generally nice, kind man like his mother. He was no intellectual, but like her, he had emotional intelligence and spades. Then he committed the, um, the soul system to end all, speaking about how successful Christmas at Sandringham with Megan had been. He said that she had finally got the family that she had never had. Oh, my sons are friendly with Meghan's nephew. Following that appearance with him on MTV's The Royal World, he and his mother had stray, stayed with us as guests at our castle in Sussex, Castle Goring. Oh, I don't think I'm breaching their conference, uh, conferences uh, to repeat what the whole family was upset what they heard. Harry expunging them out of existence. The fact said... Both branches of Megan's family had been close to her. Ooh, and then it goes on to talk about the Markles had played a far larger part in Megan's upbringing than the Raglan family, um, and her mother had been away for long stretches of time. 
And then it just said, Samantha was the first off the mark. She waded in, accusing Megan of being a shallow social climber and said that her father had always given Meg everything. While the public may have not have thought Samantha was just being a jealous sibling, their father hinted that the reason might have been something to do with Megan's ignoring Samantha's approaches. The wedding was scheduled for the 19th of May, 2018. And as the day neared, both the Marco and Raglan families were humiliated in front of the whole world when only her mother and father received invitations. Her paternal aunt, her paternal uncle Michael, who had organized the internship for her with the American embassies in Buenos Aires, was perplexed. So too were her maternal uncle John Johnson and his wife. Her nephew Tyler, whom she uh, used to, um, who used to babysit her when they were young. And then Tom Jr. wrote an open letter to Harry, stating in part, As more time passes uh, to your royal wedding, it becomes very clear that this is the biggest mistake in royal history. While some commentators thought Meghan's siblings behaved badly by berating her, others thought that they were justifiably outraged. Whatever people's points of views were, um, the fact was that the failing to invite her family had rebounded badly on Meghan, who was uh, barraged with bad publicity. Harry and Meghan had not filled St. George's Chapel to capacity, like many a thought. Aside from the hundreds of empty seats in existence, there were the hundreds of charity workers, strangers, all who had been asked, but most offensive to the many relations who had been overlooked was the presence of uh, celebrities Harry and Meghan barely knew, pray tell. A cousin who would um, ordinarily have been present, why, why are they not there, but George and Amal Clooney, Oprah Winfrey, and the Beckhams are. The invitation lists Max of a career move. And then it goes on to say, to talk about the father, how he was pictured in the most unflattering poses, the implication being that he was a drunkard as well as adult or an oink. Because his whole life had been spent in television, Tom Sr. knew that they were making a fool of him, so he agrees to stage some photographs with what seemed like a friendly paparazzo when he realized that he had been set up and had made to look like a complete idiot. He was so distressed that he suffered a heart attack and was hospitalized in Mexico. Then, um, not only after that, he was said to have had a, uh, a first or second heart attack after that. Um, but anyway, it's wounded feelings and poor judgments were about to make what the press had already uh, dubbed the Markle debacle into something that was not only damaging and destructive, but would cause unnecessary damage and pain to all parties involved. So we're getting into more of the family life, all about the wedding, and I'll be back uh, shortly, and I'll be uploading uh, uh, chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. So I want to thank you all for watching, um, or excuse me, and for listening. I know there weren't very many pictures, and uh, again, apologize for my absence, but I'll be back with you shortly. Thank you and have a great day. Please leave your comments down below. Let me know what you're thinking of the book so far.